Welcome to Between the Lines, a podcast. I'm Janine. And I'm Jess. And we both work at the Winkler branch of South Central Regional Library. And in this podcast, we talk about books with our own twist. Uh, we'll talk about the first half of the book and predict where it might be going. And then finish reading the book and discuss the second half. There'll be snark. There will be spoilers. Depending on the book, uh, there may be references to violence, sex, or other adult topics. So if that's not for you, stop listening now. And all right, we'll get into this week's book. All right, so today's book is Ride the River by Louis L'Amour. So brief summary. Alone in the big city, a fierce young frontiers woman must outsmart a dangerous con man before she can stake her claim to the family fortune. 16-year-old Echo Sackett has never been far from her Tennessee home until she makes the long trek to Philadelphia to collect her inheritance. In the wilderness, Echo can take care of herself as well as any man, but she never imagined the challenge that awaits a crooked city lawyer who intends to take advantage of her by any means necessary. Echo will need all of her wits to best the scoundrel and make it back home in one piece. So this is book five in the Sackett series by Louis L'Amour, which contains 17 books in total. And Louis L'Amour has sold more than 320 million copies of his work. By the 1970s, his writings were translated into over 10 languages, and every one of his works is still in print. Which is really so, good, because you need to buy replacement copies, because you will read them to death. <laughs> Some people will read them to death. I will read them to death. <laughs> so, I was preparing to start this book, I had it sitting, whatever, and my 13-year-old looked at it, and she says, that looks boring. And I was like, you're not wrong. <laughs> Sorry. To be fair, the cover that you have there does look kind of boring. It looks very retro, like very, very, very retro. Very. Yeah. Whereas the more popular cover that you see the most often is a little bit more uh, artfully designed, shall we say. They're on a boat, right? Yeah, they're on a riverboat. Um, yeah. And it's the two main characters and the sidekick. And yeah, it's no offense, but your cover's just not very good. <laughs> Your well, cover's like an awful green dress. and It came from a garage sale, I can tell you that much, because <laughs> it's from my husband's collection, and most of them are from garage sales. Yeah. So that's what he did when he was a kid. Hey, why not? Yeah. May as well. He would buy them by the box full at garage sales. I'm pretty sure that's the official circulation method of Louis Moore books. <laughs> it's just garage sales thrift stores. <laughs> Do you ever actually buy a new Louis Moore book? No. No, you get it from somebody's garage. Well, somebody must buy them new, though. Yeah, buy the new for they the library, just, but... They didn't all it. originate in the garage. <laughs> no, that's how we distributed them. <laughs> oh, that'd be hilarious if that was actually true. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so yeah, why we chose this book? Well... Because we needed to do a Western, <laughs> and I really, really like this book. <laughs> that's why. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. I have read, I think at this point, pretty much everything Louis Lemur's written, and... Your 13-year-old thinks it's boring. I started Louis the Moore books when I was 10. Mm -hmm. I had read them pretty much all, I think, by the time I was 15. Yeah. So, well... I disagree with your 13-year-old. And that is your right. <laughs> also, Westerns aren't for everybody. True. <laughs> true. As much as you wish they were. I, no, I just think everybody should read a little bit of everything. Yeah. But that being said, everybody's got their own personal taste and the things that they gravitate towards the most. Yes. I will admit, westerns are not my favorite. Um, I'm pretty sure I can predict exactly what's going to happen in the second half of this book after having read the first half. Are you sure? Well, <laughs> ultimately, I can predict the ending. Everybody lives happily ever after? Yeah. Except for the particular people that were shot? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that exactly. would actually be kind of right. Exactly. Um, so, but, I mean, having said that, let's discuss the first half first. <laughs> Yeah, we may as well. <laughs> I will say, uh, before we get started, this book is book five in the Sackett series, but the Sackett series follows the Sackett family from, like, when they first hit the shores of America. Actually, I think it starts in England, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then kind of follows the different generations, the different branches of the family. So, yes, it's book five, but you do not need to read them in the right order. I have never read the Sackett series in the right order. I started it off with, like, 16, then went to five, and then to two, and then back and forth again. It's fine. It doesn't really matter. There's like one or two that might be connected, but even that, you're fine reading them by themselves. So, all right. Disclaimer. <laughs> Good to know for all you Westerners out there. Yeah. So, I have read this book before. What did you think? <laughs> so, the, the first thing that 
struck me. She was talking about her uncle and he said to her, you're cute as a button and you've got a nice shape. And I thought that's kind of a creepy thing for an uncle to say to his niece. Like if my uncle said that to me, I would be like, "Mm, no. Yeah. At one point she does say that her uncle is more like her brother. (laughs) <laughs> Which doesn't really uh, make it any better. That doesn't make it better. Um, no, sorry. But, like, presumably you don't have any uncles that are almost pretty much your brothers. No, but that is true. It is quite a close family, but not that close. <laughs> I don't know. To me, that just sort of seemed like mm, slightly ick. Yeah, but that was also how things operated back in the day. Yeah, not I saying guess. it wasn't icky then, but, like... Yeah, that's true. It was more common, probably, to talk to a woman that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Which is something that I was thinking about. Like, it's interesting that the main character in this book is female. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. it's not, like, back in the day when these books were written, and the author is a man. Mm-hmm. That's so, the name Louis. Yes. But the fact that he's writing from a, a female perspective, mm-hmm. and at a time when females were not typically the main characters in these types of books. Yeah, right? no. That's the thing. He He's written one or two that have... More than one or two. Um, where the main character is female, and he does a good job of it. Like, yeah. he doesn't put it this way. Echo is not a uh, shy, reserved type woman. <laughs> no, she's not the most feminine of characters. No. But neither is she like the butch, rough and tumble. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's true. It's because she does. It does talk about her being interested in like clothing and like, exactly. fashion things or whatever too. So, like, she can hold her own in whatever situation, whether that be. A fancy dining table or against a bear. Yeah. So. Yeah. I just, at times, found her naive and other times, like... She's 16. I know. (laughs) But, like, other times she was, like, she knew exactly what to do. And sometimes I'm, like... Like, when she first gets to the city and she's meeting the people in the boarding house wherever she's staying... And she just talks and talks and talks and is telling them all these things. And I'm like, shut up. (laughs) Keep it to yourself. (laughs) Yeah. But... Also, that's almost what you kind of expect her to do. Because she's in a big city for the first time. Yeah. She's meeting new people. And she's very at u- that point, she doesn't realize that there's guys after her. Yeah. I guess she's out of her element at that in that time. And sometimes you get nervous, you talk a lot, I guess. But I just... If you think of it, like, back home, she would know pretty much everybody. Yeah. So everybody knows your business anyway. So whoop de dang if you talk about it a bit. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, the good lawyer, whose name I can't remember... Uh, Chantry? Yes. <laughs> He's got his cane. Of course, <laughs> there's a knife in his cane. Like, I'm come on. I'm not going to lie. I kind of want his cane. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the fact that he's 79 and he's still like, yeah, I've got a cane with a sword and I know how to use it. Yeah. <laughs> I just kind of rolled my eyes a little bit, though, because, like, of course there is. Well, you have to protect yourself. <laughs> yes. This is very much a good versus evil and the good guys are going to win type of story. Yeah. Yeah, like, there, there's not a whole lot of uh, twists and turns in the plot. <laughs> a lot of, you know, oh, it turns out Echo was evil all along, but... Yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> no, no. But it also, like, the first time, I don't know. She seems to get away from them very easily a lot of the time. Or, like, I don't know. She just keeps escaping and escaping and escaping. Yeah, I don't know. I find it plausible. The only one where I'm kind of going, wow, you're either very lucky or you're very lucky, is when she just walks into the, the cabin where they are. Yes. And they're like, okay what the heck and she just sits down and has herself some supper and then like picks up the carpet bag with her stuff in it and like yeah i'm leaving now yeah and they're like okay you have a gun on us so yeah i guess you are yeah where that i'm like "Mm," you know maybe yeah for the most part like yes she she gets off the stagecoach she runs after him okay she gets away from them on on the riverboat Mm. No, no, we haven't gone that far yet. We haven't gotten that far. But they show up on the riverboat. They show up and on I'm, the riverboat. Like, how do these guys keep showing up where she is? You're not very familiar with the American Midwest in the 1850s, are you? No. Okay. Basically, unless you're willing to go way off the beaten path, you've got only a couple of major routes of travel. So, in order to get back to Tennessee from Philadelphia, you only would have had one or two major routes where the stage lines were running, where your riverboats were running, that kind of thing. So... It is quite plausible that you would continue to run into the same people along this same route. Okay. Because, especially for a woman traveling by herself, there is only really one or two options for her to take. 
Right. So unless she gets but a horse she and goes cross country. Did a little detour with the wagon people, so I thought maybe that would have She did a detour with the wagon people, off. yeah. But still they know where she's headed. So even if they don't have her on this leg of the journey, they know they can probably get her on the next one because she either gets a flat boat downstream or she gets a paddle wheel downstream. So All right. that becomes possible. <laughs> Sorry, it's just <laughs> There, it, it's 1850s. There's just not a lot of options. So it does make sense as to why they keep bumping into her, even if they're not actually, like, directly following her the entire time. Okay. So. <laughs> you say so. <laughs> Sorry to ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Any other thoughts? Um, This is a pretty short book, so I didn't have a ton of... I just, this is not my first Louis L'Amour. It's my first time reading this book, but not my first Louis L'Amour because... Which other Louis L'Amour did you read? Uh, I think it was Bendigo Shafter. Mm. It's fine. Not one of his better ones. <laughs> that was the one that Mike gave me to read the mm. first time, so... Mike should have known better. He should have given you, like, Utah Blaine or one of the other second ones. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, he's a big fan, my husband, and he's read them all multiple times. And... Uh, he has a master list of all his books and it's I don't know if that's than I, am. I don't know if that's why I sort of feel a little bit like eh, Louis L'Amour because <laughs> he's a little bit nerdy about it I don't know westerns are not really my thing but um it was having said that I did not fall asleep while I was reading it well, that's a good sign <laughs> and uh I stayed conscious throughout yes <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, like it's it's not a horrible book. <laughs> oh, what a glowing endorsement! It's not horrible, and I stayed awake. <laughs> yes, I think we'll have to agree to disagree on Louis L'Amour because, um, yeah. Okay, I really like it. <laughs> yeah, I know you do. <laughs> Thing is, she is written as a competent female mm-hmm. who is neither too femininely flighty and like oh my dress or too like i'm gonna wrestle a hog Mm -hmm. like he hits the in between where she can take care of herself but she's not opposed to asking help or finding the smarter solution rather than just going no i'm going it alone irregardless yeah so she's just a capable woman and that is rare enough to find in modern day fiction never mind in fiction that's written in the 1950s 60s about you know, a hundred years prior to that. Yeah. Like, it's it's one of the reasons why it's one of my favorite Lulu Moore books, because she's just capable. I feel like she's a character that you could relate to. Mm-hmm. And to uh, Dorian Chantry, who, I mean, we sort of met, but it's like just barely. Mm-hmm. He's the more useless one, because <laughs> he's basically a city kid. Yeah, that's the impression I got. And he was surprised that his uncle would send him on... A journey like this mm-hmm. like and i was like okay so it's clearly not not his forte is he gonna be able to help her <laughs> yeah yeah who knows we shall find out <laughs> well you know i know <laughs> but yeah like we we're only halfway through the book so we're just yeah. barely getting into the action and i think they haven't even said two words to each other i think they made eye contact and, and we switched chapters <laughs> they just barely yeah so yeah she saw him at the when they were out she was out for supper with his uncle mm-hmm but they did not meet. Yeah, I think they just barely encountered each other. Yeah. At the end. But, like, these minor characters are all very untrustworthy, I feel like. <laughs> like, every, every like, she was on the stage and that was a little old lady. Mm-hmm. And as soon as, as soon as they said she had the same bag, I was like, oh. Oh, yeah, this one's yeah, suspicious. She's, she's suspicious. And then she got on the boat and she had a, a roommate mm-hmm. in her room. And I was like, okay, that lady's suspicious also. Like, all these women she keeps running into are so suspicious <laughs> yeah that's the thing I, I do tend to mistrust pretty much every single character except for the main character and sometimes the main character yeah um not in this case uh, i don't think but one of the things i think you're probably missing out on because you're not a giant lulu nerd like me and mike um <laughs> is just the world building aspect of it mm. like finian chantry is part of another family kind of it's a much smaller series than the sackets okay. um but there's like boat and chantry and like they have their individual books themselves so lulu is really good at kind of connecting everybody but without you know going harping on about the same dang family or the same person for ages okay so he kind of brings in a lot of these other characters that have their own stories have their own books that kind of thing to kind of flesh it out 
so that even your secondary characters are interesting. Mm-hmm. And you can go, I know that name. I know that person. I even know that story. Huh. Like, it, when I was going through, uh, I forget which branch of the family it was. It was one of the wilder branches, anyway. <laughs> Where they're talking about one or two of the characters. I'm going, yeah, yeah, I've, I've read that book about those characters or with those characters as additional side characters in a different Louis Moore book or a different um, Sackett book. So, by not nerding out and reading everything he's ever written, you are missing some of it. <laughs> That's an excellent sales tactic on his part. Yes, it is. Like, I'm just going to interconnect all of my books, so you have to read them all. Exactly. In order to get the full experience. Pretty much. So. Yeah. He's a smart guy. Yeah. So I would recommend you read every single thing Lou Lumor's ever written. So, just for the record. I will get right on that. (laughs) After I finish my current to-be-read pile. (laughs) Which is... Always growing always growing yes it is true cannot read fast enough my pile of books to be read is growing at a rate faster than i am reading yeah sad any predictions for the second half uh obviously she's gonna make it home safely with all the money and she's gonna fall in love with the nephew and they will live happily ever after (laughs) how many people die along the way oh probably three or four more for sure hmm I think it might even be four or five okay yeah yeah a few like yeah definitely there will be more death i'm i'm sure probably the bad guys or they'll go to jail the bad guys will not prevail oh okay. you're making a face the, the bad guys don't prevail in the more books but they don't necessarily die or go to jail sometimes he's got some very interesting uh fates lined up for them okay well then um i do expect more action mm-hmm. um do i expect many surprises or things that I was not expecting? Not really. It's not mystery. It's not suspense. It's, it's very much gonna... a action-adventure book. Yeah. Like, it's sort of like a Fast and Furious movie. You know what's going to happen. There's going to be cars. They're going to go fast. And they're going to be mad at somebody. And they're going to protect the family. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a Fast and Furious movie. I have seen one. Maybe one and a half. I don't care for that. I've seen bits and pieces. but I saw one where there was a submarine coming up through the ice and the whole thing was very we got this shot specifically for the trailer Mm -hmm. yeah 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 no there's definitely not going to be a wild twist no so yeah yeah i'm looking forward to the second half it's been ooh, good decade or two not two decades no i'm not that old Um, (laughs) well if you started when you were 10 uh, it's getting close we're not going to mention how close (laughs) (laughs) it's been a good 10 15 years i think since i've read this book so it's been almost 20 years since i read my first louis l'amour you really need to get on that and do it a little <laughs> bit more often but yeah so I'm, I'm looking forward to remembering everything that i forgot <laughs> so <laughs> sorry <laughs> i don't know why that struck me as so funny anyway probably because it's very unlikely i'm gonna remember everything i forgot <laughs> Uh, but yeah, with that, we'll leave you until the next half. And we're back with part two of Ride the River by Louis L'Amour. So, I know without asking you already that you loved this book. <laughs> I do. I really do. <laughs> I did not love it. I literally wrote down on my paper, did not love. <laughs> uh, Louis L'Amour is not for me. This is my second one, and I feel very ambivalent about both of them. So, It is one of those genres where... You like it or you hate it. Yeah. And if you are not... The thing is, it's not a mystery. Mm -hmm. It's not suspense. It is a adventure novel, essentially. Yeah. If that's not your cup of tea, and, like, adventure survivalist isn't your thing... Yeah. It's not going to be the book for you. No. But also, I feel like the Sackets are the Kennedys of the Wild West. (laughs) You're not wrong. Like, everybody knows them... (laughs) And they seem to know how to do everything. They're good at everything. They rise above. I like I literally wrote down. Is there anything these sackets can't do? Um, uh, not kill people. <laughs> They're really good at that. So, like, no sacket had ever failed to come when there was need. Even one sacket is quite a few. You yeah. know, like they also. I feel like they think quite highly of themselves. Like I'm sacket. Like. They do have an ego. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they do. And I just was like, you're not that special. You live in the woods. To be fair, this book is not 
greatest introduction to the Sackett family. Okay. If you read some of the other ones, you get it a little bit more. Okay. That being said, yeah, they get they got ego. <laughs> yes, they do. So, yeah, that was one thing that I sort of struggled with. Like, they just, whatever. Mm-hmm. I, they don't worry about anything because they know whatever happens, they're just going to get out of it. Well, they can handle it. It's... Yeah. So, I will say, though, that Louis L'Amour is a master of the cliffhanger chapter ending. <laughs> yeah, he is. Like, boom, and I'm like, well, now what? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, he's, he's really good at just going, okay, nope, yeah. we're going to go to the next one. And if, it's fine if you're just like reading the book in one sitting or yeah. you, know, you can kind of stop whenever you want. But yeah, when you actually have to stop at a prescribed time, it's I know. terrible. And all of a sudden it's like, and I'm like, but now what? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so there is that. That was, I mean, that sort of kept me reading at least a little bit, even though I didn't really enjoy it. <laughs> it was like, mm-hmm. yeah. So The thing I like about it is... It is a main character who is a woman who isn't all... Like, she's in a fairly tough situation. Mm -hmm. But at no point is she depending on a man to get her out of it. No. And even when a man does come to help her, she kind of tries to get him to go away. Thanks, but go away. Yeah. I don't need your help. to be fair, he's not the most helpful person in the world. (laughs) What does he know about it? Exactly. He's He's fairly useless. (laughs) Like, for (laughs) traveling in rough country, he... Sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah. Like, at one point, they they were being tracked by the bad guys. I forget which ones. Um, and one of the bad guys said, like, yeah, we can see exactly where he's going. But, you know, you have to actually work to make out her trail. Because she's quite careful about where she steps. Whereas he's just clomping through the woods, barely. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> city boy. <laughs> he's, like, he's almost more of a hindrance than a help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? I mean, he's there, an extra body. With a gun. Yeah. You know. But even that, it I just get the impression that she has to worry more about making sure he doesn't get himself into trouble than actually keeping her out of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. I know. There was one part when the bad guys had caught up with them. And I wrote down, shut up, Elmer. I don't care what you think. Because <laughs> he just kept, I'm like, who is this Elmer? I know. Why it took me a minute. Is, it was like pages and pages of him like narrating. And I'm like, shut up. Like, get back to the story. And then I was like, oh, I see. He finds the treasure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Fine. I, I That's... felt a little bit bad for Elmer. Because, like, he has his um, his moment where he's going, why am I here? What am I doing? Because yeah. these two guys that are worse people than me are definitely going to kill me the second they have an opportunity. Why am I even here? Yeah. And he tries to leave and he tries to go back. And then I think he dies. <laughs> Does he die? I couldn't Does remember. I can't remember. I was pretty sure he was shot by Tim. I could not keep all those I bad guys know. straight either. No, no. I had a hard time because I felt like every time there was like more. Yeah, they just keep coming. They just, <laughs> yes, they multiplied. Like, what is happening? I'm like, but, Elmer is basically a law clerk that got <laughs> dragged along <laughs> with. But, People that were, like, serial killers compared to him, where he's just basically this nerdy guy that does books. <laughs> yes, but I still don't care what he thinks. I still don't care about him, he, you know. I don't know. He wasn't necessary to the story, in my opinion, aside from finding the carpet bag, I guess. Yeah. Which was not apparent for the f- first few pages. <laughs> and then, like, there was True Love and Macon. Macon? Macon? Macon. Uh, Macon? Yeah. Like, Bacon? Yeah. And then Mordecai. Mordecai, and Mordecai sounds fun. Okay, so Mordecai, I can see where he fits in, but True Love and Macon... They they never really showed up to actually do anything. They like, were not necessary to the story at all. I, I found it interesting because I thought his logging operation was bloody brilliant, but I'm, I'm a nerd about these kind of things, okay? <laughs> I know. I grew up on westerns and adventure books and that yeah. kind of thing, so this kind of thing is right up my alley. Um, but, like, I'm like, okay, they set up the fact that Mordecai was, you know, actually going to try and track echo down and you know help her and whatnot yeah but i feel like that same thing could have been done by like an innkeeper somewhere yeah and you know it'd be fine well he could have just shown up there and that would have been a nice surprise yeah that too look because they kept hearing these random sounds right and echo knew what they were yeah so they could have just introduced him with random sounds and echo going you're all gonna die now yeah but no it's like oh i'm true love sackett I'm making Sackett. Let's insert ourselves into this situation <laughs> exactly. because we are Sackett's and we are the best. And, and we're going to save the day. 
And, like, they really didn't do anything. Like, Mordecai Mm -hmm. killed Felix? He killed somebody. He killed somebody. I thought she shot Felix to the carpet bag. I don't know. But the other two didn't, like, literally nothing. No, like, there was, like, a line saying that they were cleaning up the rest of the camp and killing off everybody else. But, like... Yeah, they most of the people were dead at that point. They did not need to be in the book no. at all. And Mordecai probably could have handled it. Oh yeah, like I'm fairly certain he was the one character I kind of liked because he seemed a bit like yeah. I need to double quirky. check and see if Mordecai actually has a book anywhere. I don't think he does. He seemed a little quirky. He seemed like a psychopath <laughs> that knew he was a psychopath and took to the woods because he figured it was better for everybody. <laughs> at least he was aware of that. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> I just I couldn't get into it. I just couldn't. Michael be so disappointed. He actually, he read this book because it was lying around. So he's like, I'm going to read it. He's like, oh, that's really not the best one. It's not the best one, especially if you're looking for like gunfights and stuff. Because it, it doesn't have gunfights, really. No. They're shooting, but not no. like, no. And so I said that you really liked it. And he was like, oh, and then I like it because of reasons that Mike will not like it. For. Yeah, I'm not going to say Mike's not going to like it for. <clears throat> I like it because it is a female character who who doesn't depend on a man. It doesn't depend on a man, yeah. and honestly, the men just kind of get in her way. Yeah. Is it the best story ever? No. Is it the best western ever? No, not even close. <laughs> it's not even the best Louis Lemur ever. But it does actually portray a strong, capable woman in an era that often cast women as, you know, either the ones reloading the rifles for the men so they can continue shooting, or the ones that are, like, hiding in a corner because, yeah, you know, big bad guns and things. It's atypical for this time period and this genre. Exactly. Yeah, I, I don't get that. don't like it because it's the best story <laughs> ever. So his response was, wow, has she read Bendigo Shafter? Yes, I have. <laughs> and I, and Bendigo and, Shafter's not my favorite either. And I told him that because you told me that. And he was like, oh. I have to have a talk with her. <laughs> and I was like, we should have okay. Mike on the podcast yeah. to debate. Um, <laughs> you, debate and, Louis you and him can debate hours. Louis L'Amour. <laughs> okay. I, he has things to say, I'm sure. But uh, uh, I don't know that I actually have a favorite Louis L'Amour. Utah Blaine's not bad. Um, I'm not a fan of the Hopalong Cassidy ones. They're Hollywood. Mm. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I won't read another one. Unless mm. I'm forced to. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, also, like, it's just predictable. Like, you know what's going to happen mm-hmm. in the end, right? Like, good will prevail over evil. I like That's true with a lot of books. Well, it's true. But I like there to be, like, a twist or yeah. something that I didn't see coming. That's what I like in a book. You want more mystery suspense aspects mm-hmm. to it. And it's not mystery suspense. It's no. adventure. It's adventure. And I like, yeah, I like action, but not this type of action. Yeah. I mean... It's one of those books where I'm going, yeah, read it. It is interesting. But if you were looking for, you know, gunfights at high noon, this is not the book for you. No. Not in the slightest. Go read it from the more. It's not, from what I would expect, it's not a typical Western. No. Because the main character is female. And, yeah. Well, Cherokee Trail, if I'm not mistaken. Main character's female as well. She okay. runs a stagecoach station. Okay. So, but it's still, like, not typical for the genre. No. No. And, yeah, it's just... And oftentimes, Lulu Moore also has a lot more history than this one has. Okay. Like, he has a couple that take place in... Oh, it is in New Mexico, I want to say. And he dives quite deep into the history of some of the things. Okay. In the area and the people and whatnot. I will say, there's no indigenous people in this book. No Native Americans. No? Is there usually? Yeah. Okay. Like, they talk about them. Yeah, they talk about them, but only in that, like, Echo's, like, not at all worried about them because her family's Sackets and Sackets are friends. <laughs> Sackets are friends. <laughs> uh, See, I am a Sacket. I can do no wrong. Everybody loves me. I'm just trying to remember now if there's an evil Sacket out there. See, now that I would be interested in. Because I want one that just went totally off the reservation. <laughs> Mordecai's probably closest. <laughs> <laughs> but... Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know, just... I'll make you read another one at some point. Uh, we'll, we'll do more of the typical shoot 'em up westerns. Okay, but maybe not for a while. Well, then we've got like 15 million other books to get through first. I know. Before I read another Louis L'Amour, you have to read a Jane Austen. Deal. <laughs> Can we do um, Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies? Yes, but I'm that's... I'm pretty sure I saw that one in the donations pile the other day. That one doesn't count as a Jane Austen, though. 
<laughs> yeah, doesn't it? It's Pride and Prejudice. And zombies. Yeah. I'd rather read Jane Austen than Little Women. Okay. Although I still have zero patience for Jane Austen. <laughs> I started to read Little Women like a year and a half ago, maybe two years. I could not get through it. I read a Little Women coloring book once. <laughs> My sister had one when I was little. <laughs> Color. I don't think that counts as reading. No, but I do have a idea of the story. That and um, in Friends, where Joey reads it. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I did read like an abridged version when I was in high school, mm. uh, which I enjoyed very much. It's again just one of those like it's along the same lines as Jane Austen, where it's like. You're just waiting around to get married, and then he but completes she, you. But she's not, though. That's the thing. I'm surprised that you don't like Little Women, because Joe is a very strong, independent woman. Yeah. And the obvious suitor for her, Lori, mm-hmm. she turns him down mm-hmm. and goes off to be independent and write and do her own thing. And that's great, but there's other Little Women that are mucking about there. If it was just about Joe, okay, I'd probably enjoy it more. Okay. But, like, it's a little flicker of light in a dark room. Well, she's sort of the main character out of the four sisters. Put it this way. I have very little tolerance for primarily romance-based books. Kill somebody, you have my interest. (laughs) Steal some treasure, you have my interest. Add a spaceship, you have my interest. What about a father who's at war? I don't care. Okay. (laughs) All right. I'm sorry, that was, like, 95% of the population at the time. Okay. I just feel like Joe is a character that you could identify with. Probably. So it kind of surprises me that. Yeah. Suffice it to say, I don't want to read Jane Austen. (laughs) I tend more towards Charles Dickens and, you know, Horatio Hornblower, which is more interesting, by the way. Also a funny name. Yeah. Horatio Hornblower. But a really good series. 10 out of 10 would recommend. (laughs) We talked about Austen versus Dickens one time. Right, we did. We should do that. It's a lot of reading. That's a lot of reading. I mean, we're, we've done Charles Dickens. Yeah, we have. Anyway. Anyway, we've gotten a little way off, off track now. Off the rails here. But, yeah, I personally would not recommend this book. I would. But, like I said, I'd recommend it for... Yeah. Specific reasons. Specific reasons. Like, if you're looking for an actual strong female character in what is not the typical Western, yeah, you'll like it. You're looking for adventure books? Yeah, you'll like it. Mm-hmm. If you are looking for gunfights at high noon, not so much. No. So. Nope. Do you have any fun facts for us? I do. I have something that I thought was very interesting. During the 1960s, Louis L'Amour intended to build a working town typical of those of the 19th century western frontier, with buildings with false fronts situated in rows on either side of an unpaved main street and flanked by wide boardwalks, before which, at various intervals were watering troughs and hitching posts. The town, to be named Shalako, after the protagonist of L'Amour's novel of the same name, was to have featured shops and other businesses that were typical of such towns. A barber shop, a hotel, a dry goods store, one or more saloons, a church, a one-room schoolhouse, etc. It would have offered itself as a filming location for Hollywood motion pictures concerning the Wild West. However, funding for the project fell through and Shalako was never built. That would have been interesting. Yeah. Would we? That would have been like I bet an interesting tourist spot, also. Oh, definitely. definitely. So, yeah. And then I'll quote from his son: "Since his death, I have done editing and bits of rewriting on many of the books that have come out. I created a very strict code where I would work to improve the stories by cutting first and then only rewriting if I had cut so much that the pieces didn't match up. I got very good at channeling Dad. Ninety-nine percent of the time, even I can no longer find the exact place where I inserted material." There is only one style of dad's I cannot do well, the flowery sort of prose that he used for some of his later novels, Beau L'Amour. So I thought that was kind of interesting also, where he talks about, like, that he can't even tell where he wrote mm-hmm. and his dad. So it would be interesting to, to read. Yeah, because he, he's taken some of the later stuff and some of the unpublished stuff and has put it out with some tweaking and that kind of thing. So, yeah, it would be interesting. It's always interesting knowing the process Mm -hmm. for you know either ghost writers or especially i mean we've mentioned this before um if people are writing books together Mm -hmm. i'm always curious as to how did you write it together Mm -hmm. like yeah did you write one part and then the next part and compare notes or yeah yeah or did somebody come up with the idea and the other person does the writing or Mm -hmm. 
yeah so when I was reading that I was like huh I wonder if like somebody who has read lots of Louis L'Amour could tell where he wrote and where his dad wrote Mm, I don't know but if he can't even tell I've read quite a bit but nothing where it's like whoa you took a turn into left field there what the heck's going on yeah um nothing like that had more of that kind of experience with some of the stuff that Louis Moore wrote that wasn't westerns. Okay. Because he did a couple that were like uh, 1940s. Mm-hmm. And I think one or two 1950s like murder mystery things. Okay. Where it's like, Louis, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> science fiction, apparently, he also wrote mm-hmm. one science fiction book. Mm-hmm. So, I don't, which. I don't know that I've read that one actually. The Haunted Mesa. No, I have read it's that called. One. Yep. So, which seems also like Sci-fi? a mm-hmm. little. That's what it said in my research. I just gotta go reread that one now. <laughs> it feels a little out of left field for a Western writer. I don't know. Have you seen Firefly? No. Oh, you haven't seen Firefly? No. Oh, you have to. It is such a good show. Okay. Damn the people that only made one season. <laughs> I'll add it to my long list of you should things to watch. Nathan Fillion. Yeah, it's hilarious. I don't think I've seen Nathan Fillion in anything. Really? I think so. Hmm. What else is he in? Uh, he's also in The Rookie. Okay. He was in one episode of Big Bang Theory, I think. I'm not surprised. I'm terrible with names. There was another one. What was it? My brain's stuck on Indiana Jones. I know that's not it. No. I don't know. I'll look it It was up. kind of a nerdy show because he was at a... Like, he played himself on Big Bang Theory, mm-hmm. I think, and they ran into him at a coffee shop. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd expect so because it's and, so uh, And they uh, thought he was Nathan Fillion, and he's like, no, I'm not. And they were like, yes, you are. I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> anyway, um, I think it was him anyways. I could be wrong, but... No, it probably was him. That sounds like the kind of thing he'd do. <laughs> oh, that's going to bug me now. What show is he in? I'm going to have to look it up when we're done recording. All right. And we're going to leave our listeners hanging. <laughs> Unless Linda cuts I'm this assuming most of our listeners, if they have YouTube, they have Google. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a safe assumption. Anyway... With that, I mean, I think we're pretty much done. Do you have anything else to add? I do not. Okay. Well, read another Louis L'Amour book at some point after I have to suffer through Jane Austen. <laughs> yes. So that's what we thought of the book. But uh, those are just our opinions, of course. Uh, we'd like to hear yours, so leave us a comment. Thanks for joining us for Between the Lines. And thanks for editor Linda. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.